Hi, and welcome to Eye of the Needle, a podcast from Columbia Threadneedle Investments that aims to demystify the world of investing and shine a light on the people that look after your money. I'm Mark King, Head of Investment Content at EMEA, and joining me as co-host is Corinne Walker, Investment Campaigns Manager. Hello, Corinne. How are you? Hi, Mark. I'm good, thank you. Tell us who we've got on the pod this time, Corinne. In this episode, we're joined by Jean Tenuzo, Deputy Global Head of Fixed Income. We'll be speaking to Jean about bonds, what's going on in the wider global economy, how he made his way into investing and generally shooting the breeze about investing. Welcome to the podcast, Gene. Hi, thank you. This episode will also feature, as always, our ongoing ABC of Investing series, our 60 second challenge, this month in history, and three things to ask your IFA this month. But before we get to that, let's start with a few questions for Gene and find out a little bit more about the face behind the fund. So Jean, let's take a look back at the start of your career. What made you want to become a fund manager? Well, it's interesting. I think in school, when you think about asset management, you always think about equities. So I decided I wanted to be a growth equity guy because that's what everyone wanted to do back then. And as it turns out, you learn over time that the fixed income market is a much larger and deeper place. And after I got my first role working in uh, what at the time was a municipal bond role, um, I fell in love with fixed income, I became a bond geek. And uh, I think <laughs> that I've been on the dark side ever since. <laughs> Do you not look wistfully back at the uh, the world of equities and think what could have been? You know, I always say that equity people just make stuff up, where fixed income people <laughs> actually roll up their sleeves and do the work. And then it's the problem. <laughs> so um, what does a typical day at work look like for you, Gene? Well, I've spent the last 12 plus years working on multi-sector portfolios. So it's my job to be in everyone's business. So as part of that, I start my day by taking part in all of the morning sector team meetings that we have. So I spend time with our investment grade credit team, uh, spend time with our structured products team, which is a bit of a US focus, spend time with our emerging markets team, and spend time with our high yield team, which are global teams in Europe and North America. So start your day within the first couple of hours getting an update from what is new and current uh, in each sector of the market. Mm. And then from there, we tend to do sort of deep dives often into one sector of the market. So my favorite meeting is our uh, monthly fixed income asset allocation meeting with our credit teams, where we pull together our investment grade teams in the US and in EMEA, our high yield teams as well in London and the US, as well as our bank loan team, and create a global debate about credit markets and where the opportunities are. That's the kind of stuff that I think is fun. And you know, after that, those meetings tend to be generally in the morning. We try to spend the rest of the day trying to slice and dice where those opportunities are and how to package them in the portfolio. And how, how often do you think of the end investor when you work? Always. And in some cases, it's because the end investor is me. I'm invested in the products. My family is invested in the products. And I think about the ride that we want to take the investor on, right? Investors' needs, quite frankly, are fairly simple. They want income. They want low volatility. Uh, but there's a variety of things we have to put in a package to achieve that objective. So, you know, the more you spend time with the client, whether that be out in the field, at a meeting, in a client review, you start to realize that um, that's ultimately what it comes down to. The client is trusting us with her money, and we have to think about a way to safeguard that and grow it. Yeah. On a previous podcast, we had a fund manager say that his mom's money is invested in Absolutely uh, right. one, of, one of the strategies. So uh, he feel, felt that pressure. That's right. Okay, a few more personal questions, Gene. Okay. Some rapid fire ones. What's your favorite book? Uh, anything by Michael Lewis. Um, people talk about The Big Short. I like Boomerang. I think Boomerang's a good book oh, too. Okay. It's about the European financial crisis and how that sort of evolved through the, you know, after the great financial crisis in 08. Very good. Huh? No movie of that yet though. Uh, no movie of that <laughs> one. <laughs> um, how about a favorite film? Uh, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Ah, Classic. first one. Yeah, good one. Very good. Uh, and what's your favorite album? Uh, Dave Matthews Band Live at Red Rocks. Ooh, I'm not aware of that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Um, sports. Oh, I grew up a New York Yankee fan, and that's never going to change. So I'm yeah. actually excited to be in London this week because the Yankees are playing a game here in London. Oh, is that right? That's right, on Saturday. So why, you should all uh, go. why Yankees over Mets? Oh, man, that's a debate within my family. My <laughs> father's a Yankee fan. His brother is a Mets fan. But, uh, you know, it's just something that at, when they were growing up, the Mets were a brand new team. Um, the Yankees history goes back a bit further. So uh, it's always something. Pinstripes have been in my blood. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And uh, finally, um, you're stuck on a desert island. What one food are you going to have with you? Oh, it has to be pizza. <laughs> <laughs> it's all your four food groups. You're all set. That's it. What, what toppings though? Oh, sausage. Okay. Very That's good. all you need. <laughs> Uh, okay, Gene, we'll be coming back to you later for more questions um, about fixed income. Great. We will indeed. Now, before we get you to take our 60 second challenge, we're going to continue our exploration of the ABC of investing. That's right, Corinne. Our regular listeners will know that we take three letters of the alphabet each episode and use them to explore some investment jargon. Uh, today, we've reached J, K, and L, having so far covered A to I, of course. So without further ado, let's launch into this week's letters. J is for junk bond. This is a lower rated bond that can also be referred to as a high yield bond. Generally speaking, the lower rated the bond, the higher the yield it will pay to compensate investors for the increased risk of investing. This is because a company that is lower rated is more likely to default on its repayment. In other words, it may not have enough money to repay its debt. K is for Key Investor Information Document, or KID for short. This is a document designed to help investors understand the nature and risks of a fund in which they might invest. Potential investors should always read the relevant KID in order to make an informed decision when investing. L is for liquidity. This refers to the ease or difficulty of buying or selling an investment. If something is highly liquid, it means it's very easy to buy and sell. An example of this could be shares in a FTSE 100 listed company. On the other hand, if something is illiquid, it means it is more difficult to buy or sell. So without further ado, we're going to test Jean's economy of language with our 60 second challenge. Jean, we just heard about junk bonds there, but that's barely scratching the surface of the fixed income universe. Hopefully you can add to our listeners' knowledge by describing your asset class in 60 seconds or less. Jean, are you ready? I am ready, let's go. Okay, good luck. Your time starts now. So in simple terms, the fixed income market is the art and science of interest rates. I mentioned earlier that the equity market just makes things up. Well, the truth is the equity market doesn't know what their cash flows are. In fixed income, we know what the cash flows are, and we have to determine the timing and the value of those cash flows and the likeliness of us to get them. And that's what it's all about. Well, that was very quick indeed. <laughs> How many seconds was that? 25 seconds. That's well, a new record. That is a new <laughs> record. Well done, Jean. <laughs> now, it's time to take a step into the financial past to see what was happening in July throughout history. On the 1st of July 1862, President Abraham Lincoln signed the first income tax bill and the second of life certainties was enshrined in the US law. The first income tax bill levied a 3% tax on all annual incomes between $600 and $10,000, rising to 5% tax on incomes over $10,000. July has seen many stock market crashes over the years. July 1971 saw a crash in Brazil that precipitated the energy crisis and the Latin American debt crisis. Then in July 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait, causing the oil price to fall, closely followed by stock markets. Then on the 2nd of July 1997, Asian emerging markets crashed, and in July 2015, the China stock market crash continued. And on the 30th of July 1863, Henry Ford was born in Michigan. The Ford Motor Company was started in 1903 with $28,000 of capital, and the company rolled out the Model T car five years later. Fast forward to 2018 and the Ford Motor Company generated revenue of $160 billion, had 199,000 global employees and sold approximately 6 million vehicles. So Jean, we heard about Ford Motor Company there. How important is the automobile sector in the US? The automobile sector is very important both in the US and globally partly because it is a very capital intensive sector. So it's a good way to gauge the confidence of corporate America or global corporations in general. It's also a good way to gauge confidence of the buying base on the consumer side uh, and on the industrial side as we start to see you know, industrial automobiles, light trucks, et cetera, being purchased more mm -hmm. when the economy is doing well and there's confidence in that growth. Unfortunately, now it's an area of a large amount of concern because the industrial cycle has really been slowing. And we've seen that globally, 
We've seen that emanate from concerns in China. We've also seen it emanate from concerns uh, within Europe around some of the emissions regulation. So the automobile sector is an area of concern for us, not just the auto companies themselves, but also the supply chains, the suppliers around them, which are large issuers in, in global fixed income markets. So in general, uh, it's an area we've been defensive on globally, uh, but there are some companies that are, are now uh, trading at pretty attractive yield levels. And, and we think about Ford Motor Company, for example, which is trading like a high yield company, even though it's still low investment grade. Uh, we think it actually can make some sense in, in a flexible portfolio. So Corinne, I think it's time to find out more about how Gene approaches the world of investing with our second round of questions. Gene, you've touched on this a little bit earlier in the podcast, but what are the main differences or challenges you face as a fixed income investor compared to, say, a fund manager in the equities world? Sure. So I think the thing that is so unique about fixed income is that it really allows us to keep our thumb on the heartbeat of the global economy. We have to think not only about the fundamentals of the issuing entity, so that be the corporation or the consumer or the country that's issuing the bonds, but also the policy backdrop, because we have central banks globally that are setting interest rate policy, as well as perhaps buying securities in what we have called quantitative easing, which has been a policy tool post-crisis. So we have to consider both of those things. And for us internally, that's where we have the intersection of our global interest rate research team, as well as our corporate research team looking at all the different companies issuing bonds. I think that's that's the exciting part and the interesting part that makes bond markets move. Is it true as well to, to say that, a, that an equity fund manager can decide whether or not to invest in a company's shares, but when you're looking at that company, they might have 20 or 30 different bond issuances rather than just a single company share? That, that's absolutely right. And it's what makes the bond market a very large and complex beast. In fact, we're dealing with new issues all the time, whereas an IPO in the equity market is something that may rarely come along. And so, you know, evaluating not just the issuer, but also the wide opportunity set within the bonds from that issuer creates, frankly, opportunity for us. And I think is something that allows for the value add of active management and fixed income. Yeah, the importance of research. Absolutely right. Uh, how, how is it that you work with a fixed income team to identify the best opportunities? Obviously, you mentioned earlier that you have your fixed income asset allocation forum for discussions. How, how else do you work with them on that? Yeah, I think the way that we do research at Columbia Threadneedle is unique. We have a consistent research process across sectors of the market, even though those sectors might be sort of unique in their characteristics. So every bond that we evaluate is measured and scored on a risk rating scale. So risk one being the least risky in our assessment and mm-hmm. risk four being the, the most risky and the, and the most at risk of you know capital loss or payment disruption. So every security is scored on that scale and allows us to have a dashboard of the opportunity set to understand where we can feel more at risk or where we can feel a little more sense of security. So for us, that allows us to see not just risk, but also help us scale our position sizes. So we'd be more comfortable having a larger position in a security that has a better risk rating. Uh, and of course, if we can get a better yield in that combination, that'll be a larger position size relative to something that is a, a risk for uh, or perhaps a less attractive yield. So having that disciplined structure across assets really allows us to have a level playing field and assess the opportunities. Yeah. Um, I had a question for you about research, which you kind of answered already, but I'll switch that to the one about how do you work globally? Because we've mm. got a lot of people around the world. How do you kind of coordinate and, and help to get all those views, you know, or, or make sense of all those views? Yeah, there's sort of the theoretical, which is thinking about you know, just the way risk works in global fixed income. And in that case, you know, we look at really four major risks. We're looking at duration or interest rate risk. We're looking at credit risk, which can come from a variety of sectors. We look at currency risk Mm -hmm. as it comes from foreign exchange. And we look at inflation risk as we think about inflation protected securities. These risks are global in nature. So when we build a flexible portfolio, we want to balance these things. Balancing those things means involving an opportunity that might be an interest rate risk in Europe. If interest rates are going down, it might mean taking credit risk in the US. So we have to have a global opportunity set. That's the way we think about sort of the high level construct. On a more practical level, we have a fixed income organization with 155 investment professionals sitting across continents. 
So it involves email, it involves video conference, it involves hopping on the phone, it involves Bloomberg, mm -hmm. and all of those things allow us to stay connected to one another so that we can bring those ideas together and build that portfolio. Um, we've been hearing a lot about the global economy being late cycle. Um, what does that actually mean and what challenge does it raise for you and other investors? Everyone does say that, don't they? We're late cycle. <laughs> and what does that mean? I think in most people's mind, in the mind of a journalist, it simply means, boy, it was the last time since that recession 10 years yeah. ago. Mm -hmm. The truth is there are all kinds of cross currents and industries that are changing within that. I was just talking to Ali Ross, who runs our global and European investment grade team this morning and talked about this exact thing. I say, boy, it seems like we're late cycle. Everyone says that, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. And we can look at, for example, AbV buying Allergan, which was announced yesterday in a huge deal. And what does that mean? Well, it means they're paying a premium price and taking on more debt to do it. Yeah. And so that's something that can be a risk to bond investors. So as we think about that, you know, we want to look for companies that may be changing their capital discipline late in a cycle because perhaps their organic revenue growth, the amount that sales are growing on their own, is starting to sort of slow down yeah. and now they're looking for new ways to acquire growth and if they're going to take on more debt or more leverage to do that we got to be pretty careful about that from a bond market perspective. So that's a key feature, late cycle is over borrowing, over leverage as we yeah, call it. Absolutely right and as I said there are cross currents, it's not true that every company is doing that, in fact there's a growing pocket of the market of companies who realize that perhaps they did an acquisition a couple of years ago, leverage is high and they're starting to pay that down, we can identify those companies, we can be in a much better place. You can yeah. look at, you know, AB InBev is doing that, GE is doing that, some unique situations there. Um, but there are other companies like we just talked about that are taking leverage up, which is actually more common late in the cycle, and that's where you wanna be pretty careful. Um, interest rates, of course, have been very low mm. uh, in the US, UK, and Europe, actually, for some time. Uh, do you think we'll stay in this low interest rate world? I think we will largely because that's what central banks have told us. In the last couple of weeks, we've heard that interest rates are likely to go lower in a variety of developed markets from Europe to the US to Australia. In fact, I think Norway was the only one that actually came out and raised rates. I don't know if they got the memo about what was happening <laughs> elsewhere in the world. I think, however, that the large move we saw from October to now is going to be difficult to repeat. Yeah. If you think about market sentiment in October, there was an assumption or a forecast, a consensus in the market that interest rates would go up three to four times in the next 12 months. If you look now, markets pricing that interest rates go down three to four times in the next 12 months that's in the US, that's about as far ahead as, as you can get in terms of that. that's the degree of pricing for interest rate change that you tend to see in the market. So the consensus has totally swung if anything, at the moment, there might be a slight risk that the market's gone a little bit too far. But in general, I think interest rates are more likely to stay low uh, than to make a significant shift higher. Um, is there any other risks you see on the horizon? Absolutely. And I, I think it would be hard to, to have this conversation now without talking about trade, because trade wars have been percolating for you know the last two years, essentially. And we're starting to see now it move from conversation to real impact on trade volumes globally. Trade volumes have declined and the most trade exposed economies are struggling. And you can look at the trade sensitive open economies in Asia, Japan, you can look at Europe and look at Germany. You're seeing a lot of weakness there in industrial production and in exports. So that gives us a lot of pause because a lot of the countries and companies whose debt we buy are in those areas. And so, you know, we, we want to have a more cautious approach to those issuers and also think about how that can apply to something like emerging markets, which are very much dependent upon global trade growing for their emerging progress and status. So it gives us a lot of concern. We would hope that as we move through checkpoints like the G20 you know, this weekend and, and, and other trade negotiations over the next few years that we can make some progress. I think politicians have, have already made their case with where their frustrations lie. And it's in the best interest of global trade, global economics and global markets to get mm -hmm. to some resolution. I would hope over the long run that calmer heads would prevail.
Yeah. Um, when we were talking about automobiles, we, we, we talked about the global supply chain, and I guess trade has huge implications for sort of shaking it up a bit, doesn't it? Absolutely, and you can use the example of tariffs at the U.S.-Mexico border. Mm. And when an automobile is made, oftentimes an individual car before it's completed will cross that border dozens of times in terms of the different pieces, parts, et cetera, in terms of manufacturing and assembly. Well, if a tariff is charged each time it crosses, then you know the, the cost of that vehicle changes pretty immensely mm. and the profitability of the automaker as well. So it, those supply chains are tightly integrated. It sounds simple to say, oh, I want to have a very nationalist policy that benefits my country in the US or the UK or Europe, et cetera. But the truth is that we have global supply chains and mm. it's in the best interest of everyone, I think, to have an efficient global supply chain. Yeah. Um, okay, just to wrap up then, um, let's go with something a bit more about you. What would you consider your greatest success professionally and is there anything you would do differently if you could go back in time? That's a great question. I think for me, um, the ability to work at a global company this way and have the ability to spend time working across the Atlantic, uh, and in some cases across the Pacific, um, is something that I really enjoy doing and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to do. And to be able to take a portfolio like the strategic income strategy that, that we offer globally is something that I'm just very excited about. I think it helps me personally that I'm married to a marriage therapist. So it helps me on a, on a personal level, keep everything on an even keel. That's a true story, by the way. Wow. Um, Set yourself up for a full So I think, I think it's one of these things where I can have a very sort of complicated, stressful uh, topic at work and then have something that can calm me down at home and, and I think that makes everything work. Yeah. And pizza as well, of course. And a little bit of pizza. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, Jean. Um, before we finish, we're going to quickly look at three things you can ask your IFA this month. Children break for the summer holidays in July, so what better time to think about whether you're putting enough aside for your children? There are plenty of savings accounts for children, but if you have a time frame of 10 years or more, you could consider investing, where your returns over time could be more than the interest you would get from a conventional savings account. Ask an independent financial advisor if in any doubt. If you're taking a summer holiday yourself, you may find yourself thinking about early retirement and spending even more time on the beach. This will only be possible if you have a pension plan in place that will see you retire with enough of a pension to live comfortably. If you need to double check whether your retirement planning is on track, check with an IFA. And finally, some people in the UK at least, depending on how they pay tax, will have a deadline of the 31st of July to pay their tax. If in any doubt about your tax situation, speak to an IFA or indeed an accountant. Well, that's about it for this episode. All that's left is to thank our guest, Jean Tanuso, our Deputy Global Head of Fixed Income. Thanks, Mark. And thanks to my co-host for this episode, Corinne Walker. Pleasure. We'll be back next time when we'll have another fund manager to take on our 60 second challenge and talk us through their specialist field. If you have any questions or suggestions for the podcast, let us know at podcast at columbiathreadneedle.com. So until next time, thanks again for listening and goodbye. Important information. Your capital is at risk. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. The analysis included in this podcast has been produced by Columbia Threadneedle Investments for its own investment management activities. Information obtained from external sources is believed to be reliable, but its accuracy or completeness cannot be guaranteed. None of Columbia Threadneedle Investments, its directors, officers or employees make any representation, warranty guarantee or other assurance that any of these forward-looking statements will prove to be accurate. The mention of any specific shares or bonds should not be taken as a recommendation to deal. This podcast is not investment, legal, tax or accounting advice. Investors should consult with their own professional advisors for any advice. Issued by Threadneedle Asset Management Limited, registered in England and Wales, number 573204. Cannon Place, 78 Cannon Street, London, EC4N 6AG, authorised and regulated in the UK by the Financial Conduct Authority. Columbia Threadneedle Investments is the global brand name of the Columbia and Threadneedle Group of Companies. The views expressed are as of the date given, may change as market or other conditions change, 
and may differ from views expressed by other Columbia Management Investment Advisors, LLC, CMIA, associates or affiliates. Actual investments or investment decisions made by CMIA and its affiliates, whether for its own account or on behalf of clients, may not necessarily reflect the views expressed. This information is not intended to provide investment advice and does not take into consideration individual investor circumstances. Investment decisions should always be made based on an investor's specific financial needs, objectives, goals, time horizon and risk tolerance. Asset classes described may not be suitable for all investors and it should not be assumed that any particular security was or will prove to be profitable in the future. Past performance does not guarantee future results and no forecast should be considered a guarantee either. Since economic and market conditions change frequently, there can be no assurance that the trends described here will continue or that any forecasts are accurate. Investment products are not federally or FDIC insured. Deposits or obligations of or guaranteed by any financial institution and involve risks, including possible loss of principal and fluctuation in value. Securities products offered through Columbia Management Investment Distributors, Inc., member of FINRA. Advisory services provided by Columbia Management Investment Advisors, LLC. Copyright 2019, Columbia Management Investment Advisors, LLC. All rights reserved.